52 countries. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Patrick Dixon. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your warm welcome. It's great to be here today. Our job is to see a vision and translate it into reality. Our job is to inspire, to motivate, to drive change, and to bring the future in. And that is what we do. And I'd say this from the bottom of my heart, having worked as a physician looking after people dying of cancer, life is too short to waste on things that don't matter. Put your hands up if you agree with me. So will you promise me, let's make a rule, shall we? Let's ask every person who prepares for a slide, say, do you, does that slide really matter to you? Because if it don't, please cut it out. <laughs> huh? Why should you subject my world to that kind of nonsense if you don't even care about it? Hello? You know, although you're laughing and clapping, I wonder how many slides would have survived your last event with that severe test. I'm sure yours would. <laughs> and you say, it's, it's difficult, Patrick. I know it is. This is a matter of life or death to the future of the conferencing movement, I have to tell you. Uh, whether it's environment, whether it's day-to-day -day pressures, 24-7 uh, working, the fact that you're having to uh, multitask every day of the week, you're working on Christmas Day, every day of the year is full of staff, emails, 4,000 a day, and everything else as well, and someone wants you to watch a whole load of slides that they think might be, well, there are things that can only happen when you gather people together. It's almost a spiritual thing. Something happens inside people that is quite unmistakable. And I'm not just talking about attending a gala dinner or going to a networking meeting or going to a trade show. All of those things are important. No, I'm talking about something, a process of revelation. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, people will say to me, you know what, I read about that in The Economist. I, s I saw my CEO say it on CNN, but it was when we were in that meeting, something happened to me. My perspective was changed. And that is the elusive moment that we all look for. And yes, it's about team building, relationships, it's about creating the tribe, because every strong organization is a tribe, a tribe of tribes. Every clan group is a tribe. Every team is a tribe. Every uh, product division is a tribe. Every business unit is a tribe. And the fastest way to grow tribes is conferencing. And the stronger your tribe, the stronger your brand will be. The stronger your brand, the stronger your tribe. So I believe, as I say, events can change the world. However, I'm a futurist. <laughs> I see 75 of these things a year. Some are absolutely brilliant in, term, in every way in terms of execution, and some are quite frankly lost in the last century. So I thought we'd go on a little journey together. You know and I know uh, we are going to have to prove impact like never before. And I can tell you it's absolutely vital that we adopt new tools to do that, but please be careful. Be careful about the metrics. You see, market research can't tell you the future, all it tells you is what people thought about the last program. But your world changes. The company changes. The situation changes. As you all know, you can't just roll out another 20 programs like the last one because you've got good valuations. So metrics are actually quite limited when it comes to futuring where your organization is going, your structure, your strategy, and the training opportunities that you need. And of course, there's the big issues about cost benefit, as we heard, whether it's the cost of oil, the cost of the environment, but the biggest cost is personal. It's always to do with people. And it's the personal dimension I really want to focus on today. Because there is one word which will drive the future more than anything else. One word which will, uh, which will give the added edge to every event that you do. One word, and it's what it is, is it about? Well, let's have a look. Here is a radar screen, an important one. Why? Because so many events, uh, forums, and seminars are to do with the center of the radar screen, 
They're to do with the, the areas of strategy, team meetings, management processes, uh, business objectives, and the rest. But I suggest to you that all the really exciting things to do with the future will always, of course, happen on that outer edge. They're the place where you look for the early signs of change. They're the place you seize market opportunities. They're the, says, they're the places where you, where you look for wild cards, risks, dangers. They're the places where we innovate. And it's actually connecting these two big worlds together, the outside uh, relatively low probability areas that we're mapping out with the core structure and values of the organization and bringing these two together that creates the energy for the future. And that's a really exciting thing to do. And so many events I've seen, they uh, focus here. It's very difficult sometimes to get people here because they can think, oh yes, it's not particularly relevant to my next quarter priorities. But it's on the outer edge, as I say, that you will get most of the, of the excitement. It's on the outer edge too that you see low probability but potentially high impact risks that come crashing into programs. They remove people from your programs suddenly because there's a merger or an acquisition or something like that. Put your hands up if you have lost faculty or team members from a program two weeks before because of a change in the environment, economy, merger, acquisition. Put your hands up and wave them around. Come on, you lost people two weeks before. A big plan, your main speaker vaporized. Why? Because the future is uncertain. Sudden events. Sudden events, my friends, happen often. And they happen more often than we think in combination. What do you think? What do you think is the chance of two people in 24 sharing the same birthday? What do you think? Let's have the lights up again just for a moment. If you think that it's um, less than 5%, put your hands up now. Less than 5%, two people in 24, you've got them in your room in the program, less than 5% to have the same birthday. Put your hands up if you think it's less than 10%, 10% or less. Put your hands up. Very good. Okay, a good third. Put your hands up if you think it's 20% or less. No way is it more than 20%. Put your hands up and wave them around. My friends, the risk is 50%. 50%, you can go and look at Wikipedia uh, if you like. There's a whole article by mathematicians on this. The risk of 2 in 30 having the same birthday is 70%. The risk of 2 in 50 having the same birthday is 90%. What does that tell you? It tells you that in our complex world, where all kinds of things are welded together in globalization, in real time, all kinds of things can happen in combination that you would never imagine, right? And when they do, they have all kinds of unexpected consequences. Hmm. I was uh, staying in a hotel recently in New York. Uh, you know the one, 4,322 stories and a couple of lifts. I, I was late, I confess I was late. I was, I was supposed to be downstairs in, in, in the ballroom rehearsing, and uh, there I was. We were stuck, and there was quite a crowd by the lift door. And I was, well, you know what? I, the button was lit. And at that moment, I just didn't know what to do. I was tempted for a nanosecond to do something totally crazy. I was tempted, my friends, to go and press that lift button more than once. <laughs> okay, confession time. I'd like you to put your hands up. I know that none of you would do such a crazy, irrational, illogical, and rubbish thing. <laughs> but I know that you're tempted sometimes. So put your hands up if you've been tempted, I want to see. <laughs> okay. Put your hands up again if actually uh, you confess. You actually did it. <laughs> you know what? I was talking to uh, a whole load of airline pilots in Dallas, Texas, and I'm very interested in airline pilots because I fly a lot. I asked them the same question. I said, put your hands up if you talk to the lift. Come on, baby. It's time to come, man. 98% of all airline pilots in America, Europe, and everywhere else in the world talk to their lifts. That worried me. Because you know the question I want to ask on your behalf now is, uh-huh, 
put your hands up if you talk to the plane. They all do. They all talk to their planes. They talk to the lifts. They talk to the dog. They talk to the cat. They talk to the grass, and they hug the trees. Well, I, what do we learn from this? Seriously. You see, you can think the future is about your technology and your products, and you're partly right. You can think that the future is about customer relationship management. You're right. You can think the future is about listening to your employees about what's really hurting and what they're really struggling with right now. You're right. But I'll tell you something, my friends. As you have shown me, you, the intellectual giants of America and Europe and everywhere else as well, you have shown me that when we are under pressure, we behave totally irrationally. And if we remember nothing about the future, we must remember that the future, therefore, my friends, is about emotion. And we see it in the subprime crisis. We saw it in the reaction to SARS. We see it in just about every market shift. I don't know of a CEO that thinks their share price is based on rational logic. If it goes too high, they say, huh, I wish they'd talk it down because I'm going to get my head cut off when the thing comes down. They just talked it up too high in the first place. And then others say, it's too low. I don't know what they are missing. They don't seem to understand what our business is about. So the future is about emotion. And wherever you go, I find it, wherever I go. And you find it in people's lives, the individual passions that they have. I talked to someone yesterday, we had a kind of a book club thing, and someone was there in that meeting, she said, you know what, I confess to you, and she found this hard to say. She said, I'm really glad I came now, but I really didn't want to come, because I've got a kid back home, and I haven't seen her in ages, and my boss told me I had to be here. And I'm a single parent mom, it's tough for me but I had to be here. Emotion, my friends, is really, really important. If we touch emotion, we will find the future. And that emotion can be triggered by all kinds of things. And we can get lost in all kinds of fun and policies and strategies. But the fact is, what do people actually feel? Here is a conference that you can see as it's structured is relatively formal. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much going on, but because there's passion and emotion, the fact that the speaker is simply fixed to the lectern. He didn't move at all for nearly an hour away from his stand there. The fact that we couldn't hardly see any of his body because it was hidden by a piece of wood. And the fact that the lighting was poor, I'll come to that, the seating uh, and all the rest. Of it. it didn't matter at that moment. Why? Because there was passion in what he said. He was actually talking about the environment as an activist, uh, talking to a whole load of companies who had asked him to advise them and they were hanging on every word so emotion passion is absolutely vital I want to show you a video that was banned in my country you may have seen it uh, it passed the market research test with flying colors but as soon as it was shown on TV in my country there was such an outcry they had to take it off the air I thought you'd like to look at it you may have seen it before but the question is why was it banned <laughs> My friends, I need some help. <laughs> what is wrong with my country? <laughs> you laugh, you, some of you bang your heads on the table. And think, Listen, actually, it is a sensitive video. What's the video about? What's the message of the video? Life is short. It really matters. And I'll tell you why it matters. Because I happen to believe that one of the biggest wastes of life is poorly thought out events, presentations, workshops, and seminars. Work-life balance is number one or number two career priority for almost all the people who work with you across the whole of America or wherever else you work in the world. The only exception to that are some of the emerging economies where I work. India, China, it's different. Vietnam, I concede, it's different. Zimbabwe, it's certainly different. But I tell you, on the streets of New York uh, or, or, uh, or London or Paris, work-life balance is number one, number two. And let me just see a poll. Again, lights up, please. I just want to get to know you. I just want to understand what is going on in conferencing right now. Put your hands up if you've had a conversation with someone that you love about your own life-life balance in the last year. Put your hands up. My friends, this is a hurting issue. It's an important issue. 
I remember talking uh, at a conference at UBS um, in Switzerland, and it was 10 years ago, and there was a guy who burst into tears in the middle of a seminar with 24 people there. He just said, I wish I wasn't here. And then described the domestic situation at home. These are real things. Sometimes I believe that our conferences and events may even have been the final straw that's bust a marriage, that split a family. You say, oh, well, it's only a three-day program. No, my friends, it isn't. You require people to travel 24 hours on a plane one way, 24 hours on the plane the other. They were so jet-lagged, they were rubbish for their families for most of the rest of the week because they went straight into the office again as soon as they got back. And you know what? Uh, during the time that they were there, uh, they did a clock up. They worked out that with business meetings and client meetings and other things they'd had to do, they had already traveled 14 days out of the previous 28 before they came on your three-day event. My friends, these people are really, really struggling in these issues, and we need to be very sensitive to that. I'm, I'm very sensitive to executive education programs that require people to travel from Hong Kong to New York on a Saturday so they can be there by Sunday afternoon, so they can be there from Monday through to Friday, so they can be there rubbished and trashed for the following weekend when they fly home, so they can be bright and breezy at work. Are you, uh, do you agree with me, or is there, am I just fantasizing here? <laughs> So how can we do it? Well, cut out the gala dinner for a start. <laughs> You're great, you said. <laughs> you said, well, actually, I love gala dinners. <laughs> but I sure wish my wife was there as well. Um, I, I, I'm exaggerating to make a point, as I hope you realize. So please don't be offended if your ministry in life is producing gala dinners. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about passion. Passion for family, passion for friends. But passion's wider than that. I want you to put your hands in the air in a moment. If you have given time to something you feel really passionate about, outside of your home, outside of your work, you were never paid to do it, you just did it because, you know what, you couldn't help it. It's just the right thing to do. It might have been you shook a tin for the tsunami disaster. It might be that you uh, do uh, the accounts for a small orphan project in Zimbabwe. It might be that you help out at your children's school and you raise money there. It might be that uh, you're, you're active in your local church, as I am, or a synagogue or a mosque or whatever it is, but if you've given time to something that is a, some kind of community thing or whatever, in the last couple of years, put your hands up. Now, let's have a look. Have a look around, turn your heads around, and wave those hands, and feel a nice warm feeling inside, and give yourselves a nice round of applause. Because you know why? You see, you can put up a figure about whatever it is, $2 million or whatever it is, collected for the uh, MPI Foundation, which is a fantastic thing, but you know what? It's only a tiny fraction of all the passion in this room. And when I touch the passion, when I was, if I was to go down into, you, into your audience right now and ask one of you why you had your hands up, I will discover something amazing about you. I will discover what you'll do when you'll leave your organization. I'll discover what you want to be known for on the day of your funeral. I'll discover the thing probably that the rest of your family get excited about as well. And I will learn more about the passions that you have and what drives you in three minutes with these kind of conversations than working you with you on the same programs for 30 years. Passion, my friends, is absolutely vital. And if you've got that, if you understand why people are on your programs or why they're not, whether they've chosen to be there or whether they're because they're afraid they're not going to be promoted unless they do, if you understand what it is that they're looking for, then we have a means of really helping them create a better future. You know, I often share a conference a platform with a CEO of a large organization, a huge organization. And I have to say, most of the speeches go a bit like this, and please forgive me, but um, remember, I'm, I'm on next. I'm the, I'm the next speaker, so you have to imagine that I'm sitting in another chair here, okay? So I'm listening to this guy. I'm rewriting my speech as I go. Because <laughs> the speech almost always goes like this. First of all, then he's checking the autocue's working. And he says, well, he says, uh, as you can see, we um, did this, that, and the other on the sales, and uh, we increased our market cap, as you can see very clearly here, by 2.15%. And I'm pleased to say that we confounded all the analysts. <laughs> <laughs> a 
and uh, we will improve our market share, I believe, by 3.5 percent in the next six months and 4.2 percent in the following eight months, and all the rest of it, and all the rest of it, well done, and everybody else, and may uh, you enjoy your Christmas bonus, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm on next. Actually, during the speech, I've been panicking. <laughs> See, I, I, I'm saying, I'm saying to Sandra here on my left, hey, Sandra, how's it going? She says, oh, oh, you woke me up. I was asleep. <laughs> Sorry. He, he's still going strong about market cap. We're on our 48th slide. I can't read any of them, but never mind. So I, 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 I dig Tim. He looks up like a startled rabbit. He's doing his blackberry under the table. <laughs> I asked Jim, I say, Jim, got any guidance for me how I follow this? He says, God help you. <laughs> now, the trouble is, I'll tell you what's really sad. The CEO comes off and he sits down and he thinks he's made the speech of his life. He actually thinks, according to his coach, that he did rather better than last year. He actually thinks that he is now given the marching orders which will drive change through the whole organization for the next 225 years. <laughs> Trouble is, I saw the energy melt away almost the moment he got up. I saw nothing in terms of passion around the room. Why? Hmm. Let me ask you another question. <laughs> you see, I'm doing a book. It's called uh, People Who Get Out of Bed to Make Shareholder Value and Bottom Line Profit. That's why I'm having trouble. <laughs> I said to my publisher, this is a great one. Everybody's talking about it. So, uh, let's, uh, so I started to interview people. I'll try. Please put your hands up. Uh, put lights up. Put your hands up if you know someone who says, oh, thank God I'm alive today. Let's go and make more shareholder value, bottom line profit, and Excel spreadsheet numbers. Ah. <laughs> Put your hands up if a session in almost every event you do contains that rhetoric, language, and a load of stuff. <laughs> what are we doing? We're promoting things that we know that people on the whole don't care about. They care about themselves. Yes, stimulating uh, job, being stretched, imagination, dynamic team. I enjoy the team, uh, the atmosphere. I'm provoked. Yes, I, I care about my family. Yes, I've got passions for the community. But what about that stuff? Life is more than that. Here's another speech. Insurance company executive. He says, as you know, we exist to pay out, not to collect. Our purpose as an insurance company is to pay out when people are in trouble. And I'm proud of our record. I'm proud to tell you that this year we paid out to help over 26,000 people who became orphaned because both mother and father died in a car crash. I'm proud to tell you that we were there for another 18,400 people across America who lost their homes through fire, earthquake, or flood. I'm proud to tell you that we were there at times on long calls when sometimes it even took someone 25 minutes on the end of the phone of silence before they were even able to tell our call center operative their name. And the reason? Because two hours earlier, her husband had dropped down dead. And she's not even sure where the insurance policies are or whether the mortgage is covered. I tell you, my friends, we are about protecting lives. That is what we are for. We collect premiums in, and almost every penny of what we're collecting goes straight out. We run almost our entire administration on the amount of money we've got in the bank and the interest we earn. We are a community cooperative, and yes, we make money. And you know who we made money for this year? 75% of all the wealth we created in the last 12 months went to the pensioners of America, and I'm proud of that. At this time when people are losing their homes through subprime, at the time when share prices can't be trusted, I resolved that I would take in trust the money that's given to me by pensioners and people like you and I, putting money in, setting aside for the future. You and other pension funds invest in our corporation. We are building the wealth for the future. I'm proud of the profits we make. I'm proud of what we do. I'm proud of the way we change people's lives, and I want you to join me in going the extra mile and making the difference when it means being more efficient, cutting costs, being more effective, more caring, more sensitive, and let's go and sell a whole lot more product because we believe in it. Thank you very much.
And you touch passion, because passion, my friends, is about more than data and more than logic. You know, one of the problems about conferencing is the mechanics of the human brain. Let me explain. If you look at your ear, it can process 125 words per minute. But your eyes can process over 5,000 words per minute. If you're given a newspaper this morning and you need, you've only got two minutes before the CEO is going to ask you if you saw the article, I tell you, you will read it very quickly. The reason that you can do that is because of an astonishing fact that if we look not at your ears but at what your eyes can do, we find this, that your ears can only process 112 characters of information, 1,000 characters of information a second. But your eyes can process three terabits of data a second. And that is one of the most important facts for any conference organizer to know. You see, if you were to distribute to someone attending your event the autocue script of the person who's going to speak for the first half hour, you'll get 120 times 30 number of words. How long would it take you to read 120 times 30 words? Less than 15 to 20 seconds to get the feel of it. So why would you go? Why would you stay? There has to be another reason. And I tell you this, just listening to speakers is not enough. It has to be something that touches passion that's an experience. I went to Melbourne recently and this wonderful city and I was just walking down the street past these strange towers and suddenly I was shot out of my skin. Whoop. Whoop. That was a mega blast of gas, my friends, coming out of just one of a hundred towers going across the Melbourne River. It was so spectacular. It was street theatre exciting. I don't know what it does for global warming, but never mind. You know, we're in an age that wants to see, wants to feel, wants to experience. So theatre is everything. Breathing the same air, having fun, uh, being there together. Yes, we saw it together. We did it together. I, I was uh, watching a busker recently. Busking is in. You know what? Live performance is everything. Groups, uh, music groups of tomorrow will give their content away. On my own uh, YouTube site, 900,000 people have watched my own YouTube video clips of these kinds of events. Just give it away. Why? Because the premium is in breathing the same air. It's not listening to a videotape. How last century can you get? 85% of all energy and passion is lost in the transmission between the speaker's voice and personality and the back row, and 65% doesn't even make it to the front seat. And that's a real challenge for you, and let me prove to you why. And theatre knows all about this, which is why they concentrate on focusing attention, but it's a struggle even for the best theatres in town, even for Mamma Mia, just around the corner. And I'll show you why. Let's put the lights up. I want you to do the thumb test for me. This is the most important test in preparing any venue for a conference. Put your thumb up and hold it against my face right now. I'm going to stand right still so I can see you. And I can tell you that in the back row, at least 85 to 100 people have disappeared behind my thumbnail. Okay? Right. I want you to tell me. Keep your thumbs up. Keep looking. All right. There we are. In the back row, I'm talking to you now. Put your hands up if... If, if, if my body, more than my body, has disappeared behind your thumb. Okay, there we are. The f All right, now one third of the road back, one third way back. Put your hands up if your thumb has, has lost my head and shoulders and everything else as well. Wave, wave your hands if that's the case. My friends, this is the tenth row back, tenth row back, and I'm smaller than your thumb. That's a bit depressing for me. How am I supposed to communicate with passion and the rest? I know we can cheat with the video screens, but actually, you know what? Last night, even with the video screens right in the far corner, my entire body disappeared behind my thumb of that big image over there. What it means, my friends, is closeness is everything. We need to maximize getting the audience in, and that's why round tables are such a waste of space, literally a waste of space. They get the audience too far away from the action. Yes, it's fun, but actually, how many times have you stood up on a platform and people had their backs to you on a round table? Uh, you know, it's, we need to think through very carefully what we're doing. Here is an example. Look, look at these front seats. These front seats down here will command a price of $250, at least, more. Uh, the ones just five rows back, it's $100 less. How about that? 
five row, five, uh, just, just, just five rows back. Look at all this wasted space. These are the best seats in the house. They're worth $250 each, if this was Mamma Mia. It's a corporate event, so we don't bother to think about the layout, but actually getting the audience close is incredibly important. Absolutely vital, we think, about bringing people in to create a conversation. So we can see the hands go up, we can walk around the audience. Yes, and we create tracks so people can walk down. And lights help to bring people in. Lights are really important uh, in, in creating closeness. And we're going to demonstrate this for you. We're going to show you poor lighting. Poor lighting, most ballrooms, this is a fantastic venue. This is the biggest ballroom in the world. But most ballrooms are lit with general staff chandeliers which wash lights all over the place. There's hardly any more light than this on the screen. You know what it's like. You, if you're lucky, you have a couple of spots left and right. There's nothing much there. The speaker is in semi-darkness. He's uh, highlight, silhouetted against uh, a slide which is too bright. And this, my friends, is average conference lighting. And put your hands up if you've been there. You've seen that. Right. Okay, it's awful, isn't it? And I'm a long, long way away. Now, let's light it beautifully because we've got the best lighters in the world here. So give them a round of applause. They've done a great job. Okay. <laughs> My friends, it makes a difference. And you can bring the house lights down. Why? Because it helps bring attention in. Okay, so we need to think about how we stage things. We need to think about how we communicate with audiences. We need to think about just about every detail of events because I happen to think that a lot we do is a whole last century stuff. And it's about in theater in small groups. Yes, engaging people, whether it's stuff on the ground, whether it's uh, walking around tables. Yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's engaging people, it's passion, it's involvement, and all the rest. Oh, my goodness, what on earth have we got here? This is a disaster, isn't it? Um, <laughs> what have we got? Well, the most they've got their eyes closed. Is he, is he doing his BlackBerry? I can't quite see this guy down here. I think he's doing his BlackBerry. He's not looking anywhere. Um, he's fast asleep, he's yawning, and uh, this guy, well, I don't know what he's doing. By the way, the names are hopeless, you can't read them, they're too small. Apart from that, it's a brilliant event. Um, what are they doing under the table? I just want to know. Uh, we're laughing, but you know, we, there are so many events like, oh, by the way, what's on the screen? Oh, my word, you can't read a single word of it, and there's too many lines anyway. So, this is easier, it's more comfortable. Why? It's more conversational, we can involve people, but we could treble or double the energy by asking them to stand up. Less comfortable for them, but actually it's very difficult to speak with power to an audience when you're sitting down. You just deflate, you flow onto the floor. So I'm just saying, let's pay attention to detail. Oh, there's another one. Mm -hmm. This is interesting, isn't it? Let's look at the faults. I'm not saying they're faults, but you get the idea. We're talking future. You've asked me, conferencing 2020, what does it look like? It doesn't look like that. Why? Well, what's up there? This lectern, this huge thing, including his body so he can't be seen. Uh, he's also f uh, reading notes, it seems, which is a bit of a pity. He obviously doesn't know his stuff. Uh, we've got a monitor down here. Oh, sorry. Someone must have written it for him. You know, so often, so often I turn up to events and I can see there's a lot of people writing this stuff, stuff, this guy's stuff. The CEO hasn't written his own speech even. Well, maybe he can't be trusted, I don't know. Oh my, how can you communicate passion if you're not even writing your own stuff? You might want to tear what few hairs I have out of my body. Then what about this? This is pure waste of space. I know you're going to say, Patrick, that's a, obviously a breakfast and things like that. Yes, that's fun. By the way, there's another problem. There's a woman in there, she's got torticollis. Do you know what torticollis is? It's a medical condition, very painful. It's when you've been listening to a speaker like this for too long. <laughs> then someone like me has to come along and go, <coughs> it's extremely painful. If you ever see a speaker, if you ever get up in front of an audience and see people sitting like that, please take my advice, ask them to turn their chairs around. We've got lousy lighting. I mean, it's not good. This is pretty bad. Look at the size of the screen there. I mean, what's that? Oh, by the way, the image doesn't even fill the screen. That's bad, but the screen's just empty. Never mind. The lighting's pretty awful. I mean, it's pretty mediocre, isn't it? My friends, this kind of conferencing just can't continue. Conferencing where people aren't passionate about what they believe. They're not saying their own material. Um, they're coming out with stuff that doesn't inspire anybody, and actually I don't believe inspires the CEO. Let's go back to that CEO. You know what? I know what really inspires him because I have a glass of wine with him in the night time. What happens if he doesn't make his numbers for two consecutive quarters? Uh-huh. Go on. 
So please don't tell me he has a deep emotional attachment to the future strategy of the organization. Perhaps he does, but it certainly isn't showing. <laughs> so what about technology? And uh, with this, I need to wind up too close. Technology, really important. You were hoping I was going to talk all about technology as a futurist. Well, lots of people are doing it, and there's lots of technology here. It's fantastic, and you need it, and you need to involve yourself with the stuff, and we've got these brilliant systems using your mobile phones. All I'd say is be careful. For instance, you've seen how many votes I've taken by looking around. I could have done it through e-polling. Put your hands up if you've used an e-polling system, electronic polling system. They're wonderful for inquiring about people's sex lives in the audience. It's great. <laughs> You'll get the truth about whether they're leaving the organization next week. But you lose theater, right? Have you ever heard of comedians saying, press the button if you liked my joke? Why? He wants to know where the laughter's coming from. He says, oh, madam, let me tell you, because he heard you laughing loudly. He said, and what is wrong with you, my friend? He said, he's reacting. You see the lights going up. You see hands going up. This is theater. Why? Because it's involving people. And uh, we need to be careful. Here's another example of it. Text your questions to Patrick Dixon by SMS, and we will bring them up to him. Great. But actually, I'd quite like to eyeball the person who's giving me a question, wouldn't you? And wouldn't you like to know where in the audience is coming from, the tone of voice, the accent, the country, something about them? So let's be careful about technology. Video conferencing, fundamentally important, especially in the area of rising uh, fuel costs and rising pressures on time. Yes, incredibly important. This, uh, this image in the middle here uh, was, is from 10 years, well, nearly, it's a few years ago now, is when the SARS happened. I couldn't travel. This was in my home my own video wall, and I was communicating, lecturing to nine countries at once about the economic impact of SARS on various countries. Yes, that's great. The trouble is, most people don't have a video wall. They have a tiny thing like this. You do the thumb test. Next time you're in a video conference suite, do a thumb test on the face of the person who's on the wall, and you'll see the whole body and the rest of the team will disappear. My friends, we could do better than that. It costs nothing to turn a big data projector on and wash an entire wall floor to ceiling, as we've been trying to do just now with me. In fact, we have been doing just now. We've been playing around with video, trying to produce a life-size model of me, because that would be fun, wouldn't it? Video conferencing, where the person is standing. Yes, don't let them sit down on a video conference. Not if you want passion. Passion's not going to come across when they're sitting like that. Let's try and reproduce the dynamic. If you want someone to convey a video message to your conference, for goodness sake, stand them up. Uh, video conference suites, yeah, many errors, small screens, washed out, and poor lighting and the rest. YouTube. Now, video is actually very unpopular. Put your hands up if you enjoyed your last video conference and are dying to do it again soon. <laughs> oh. Put your hands up if you've actually done a video conference in the last year. Put your hands up. Okay, so we had almost 0% who liked this stuff. Um, and, you know, I could show you why. Video... Uh, you know, the first thing you need to know about video is that the eyes are the window of the soul. And uh, I just need a camera to come in nice and close. And let me show you something about video conferencing. By the way, just turn to the next person to you and tell them what you had for breakfast. But don't look at their eyes, look at their hairline. Okay, I just want you to do that now for 10 seconds. Look at their hairline. If there's a problem there, just look at their eyebrows, okay? <laughs> okay, my friends. What does it feel like? Strange, artificial, exotic, bizarre. Welcome to video conferencing. <laughs> I once did a video conference. All I saw was his right ear. Why? The camera was here. The, ca uh, the uh, screen was there. You see, video conferencing, this is video conferencing, coming in nice and close, probably a bit closer than this. And you see, most video conferencing is like that or like that. Usually like that, as my bald head is all anybody sees. Why? Because I'm looking at the screen. Where's the camera? Above the screen. Therefore, you get no eye contact. I promise you, you cannot communicate without eye contact. Watch this. I, I just check you with me. Hi. I've got some difficult news to tell you. Uh, and I'm not really quite sure how to communicate this. I wish I was here with you. The fact is, I wish I was in five countries today. We weren't able to tell you about these redundancies and the wind downs before this very moment, and the reason why, because the, of the market rules. So I'm happy to tell you in the most lousy way possible, but just believe me, I'm really sorry about what I'm happy to tell you now. I'll tell you what, when you've got eye contact, you've got a small chance that they will trust what you're saying is true. You'll never build confidence without that. 
So the first rule of video conferencing, don't look at yourself. You can tell when people do that because they keep touching themselves like that. <laughs> don't look at the other people when you're talking. If the camera is somewhere else, look into the camera. It's the first and the most important trick. Okay. And uh, the YouTube world is a crazy world. It's a world where trust is based on uh, all kinds of extraordinary things. Most people will trust a blog comment more than they will believe the official statements of your organization about any issue. And most people will trust a chance comment or a YouTube video clip. YouTube is the biggest video, biggest video station in the world. They'll trust a single YouTube clip by someone who attended your program more than any amount of information you send out. So my, my friends, we need to use this medium and we, I believe we should give our materials away. Just let it go. Let it be your greatest advert and your greatest bit of corporate and social responsibility. You say, well, we'll not the confidential stuff. Of course not. Just let it go. Just let it go. It's part of the Wikipedia world. And finally, I just want to say something about the environment in the last one minute and 22 seconds. The environment, we can have our own views on it. But remember, the future is not about science. It's about emotion. Therefore, you might have different views about whether the global warming science is robust or not. It is irrelevant. I happen to think that the global warming issue is likely to be very, very significant. But what is important is that you know that your consumers, those on your programs, and everything else as well, are increasingly passionate about it. Think how many heads of state were talking about global warming three years ago, and think about now, and then think about tomorrow. So it's an absolutely massive issue, and it will change every single thing that you do in terms of moving people around and energy use. We underestimate it at our peril. Now, I have good news for you. Although conferencing is one of the greatest users of aviation fuel in the world, I work with a number of airlines, so I know that. It's a big chunk of their profits. I can tell you some good news, which is there is a way which I would commend to you for managing that process, which would otherwise cause tension. And the process, many of you are very familiar with, but I would say we're hardly seeing it used yet. And that is to use carbon offsets where you're buying a, a, an allowance, or you're paying an amount of money into a fund which is used to buy a carbon credit for the future. And how does it do that? It does it by protecting a rainforest somewhere. It does it by, by uh, installing a hydroelectric plant which wasn't quite viable in a part of India which can now operate, a small one, on a small river, which is ecologically sound. It does it in all kinds of small ways, converting a school in Texas to a wood-burning boiler so they're no longer burning oil, whatever it is. And these things buy you a credit, which you can offset against your travel. The cost of doing it is almost zero. It would cost probably $25, $30, $35 per person here, $40 per person here, to, uh, in addition to the big cost of you coming to offset everything, including the water, the heat, the light, the food, everything else as well, even the electricity used to illuminate the stage right now. So, in conclusion then. What I say is this, this is a great day, it's a day of, of change, a day of transformation. It's a day when people are rethinking all kinds of things, whether it's their energy policy, whether it's their products and services, whether it's how to invade the Wikipedia world, whether it's how, ways to tap into the new passions people have for work-life balance and new career aspirations. And whatever it is that you are involved in, I would say I believe in your mission. I believe that you, your conferences, your events, your processes, your workshops, your forums will transform America and beyond. They have a power to change the whole of society, whether you're in a non-profit, whether you're in a commercial organization, whatever it is that you're doing, let's do it with passion because we believe in it, and let's make a difference with every day and make every day count. Thank you very much.